Welcome all. Dan Cilio, National Football Show on this Tuesday. Coming out of a fantastic 4th of July weekend. Celebrate America. How could you not love this past weekend, man? I got a chance to sit by the pool. I was just talking to my guys before we came on the air. My favorite time is when I could just sit around with my family, enjoy a holiday, an extended weekend. It was just great. And, you know, you you, you get a chance to catch up. And I know, and I'm a, people are probably saying, well, what do you mean, Sills? We just were locked down when it came to the pandemic. No, nah, this is different, though, man. You know, you can go to the beach. You can get in your car. Hey, taking drives with your family again. Tell me that's not something that, you know, we took for granted before. Just being able to stay together, go to a restaurant, have yourself a great time. That's what the summertime is all about. And with the summertime approaching and everything going around football, camps are starting up July 26th, 27th in the National Football League. Can't get any better than this time of the year. Now, I will say this. So the NBA playoffs have been, I don't know, interesting. I just wonder what the NBA finals are going to be when you have the Phoenix Suns and the Milwaukee Bucks in them. You know, there was a finals a couple years back that had the Spurs and Nets in it. I think there was Jason Kidd's New Jersey Nets team that was in it. Nobody watched it. You know, the lack of star power. This This is what hurts the majority of the leagues outside of the NFL. You could still have Tennessee versus, say, Atlanta in the NFL Super Bowl, and people would still put a huge number up and watch that game, right? The National Football League is more generated around the teams than they are around the faces in the league. Am I right when I say that? Now, obviously, there are certain faces in the league that generate more clicks, more views. People know that there's a storyline, Patrick Mahomes, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, those guys, Russell Wilson, you can go down the list of the guys that are your favorite players that still resonate when it comes to popularity. But that league is not generated on that. The National Football League, they make sure that it's about the league. You're only as strong as the weakest link that's in your league. That's why every year the National Football League does this. Worst team gets the number one pick. You get a weaker schedule. They try to help the entire league. You know, they're just not sitting there placating to the top 10 teams that are in their sport. They're not doing, hey, let's just make it so that the Dallas Cowboys get everything. That's not what they do. They're trying to help the Jags. Look at what the Jags, we've been talking more Jaguar football this year than I can remember in any time of my broadcasting career. Sitting around talking about Jaguar football in July, really? That's crazy, but that's what the NFL's beauty is. And now we're going to sit around and we're going to be talking about the Milwaukee Bucks and the Phoenix Suns. Well, I would tell you this. I'm not interested in that. I am a, I am a big star guy. Now, will I check it out? Obviously, I'll check it out. Want to see if Milwaukee wins? But what's my vested interest in this? Seeing if Giannis wins and justifies those two back-to-back NBA MVPs? I don't know if that's enough for making me to go like this, to get my channel changer and go, all right, man, let's go over here and let's click it on here and let's watch. I don't know if that's doing that for me. I really don't think that's doing it. Hey, the Phoenix Suns and Chris Paul is a good story. Yeah, kind of. But it's really nothing that makes me go, okay. Because the sport itself is not making me that interested in it. You know, LeBron James, what was going on in Brooklyn? They kind of had my attention. Could James Harden? Maybe. Hey, and I don't mean to bore people to death with me opening up with my show with this. Because the conversation that I'm having right now with you, I'm getting bored. I'm getting bored with this. So, I mean, these are going to be some of the worst-rated NBA Finals games, I think, in NBA history. I just don't think it's really going to be great numbers because there's really not a lot of storylines that are wrapped around what's going on in the NBA Finals. Game one's tonight. Did you even know it? I mean, really, 
And then you got Major League Baseball going on. Fourth of July weekend, you got Major League Baseball. And here is this. What's the storyline? I don't know. For me, it's Shohei Otani. Guy is the best baseball player I've seen talent-wise since Barry Bonds. This guy's incredible. So he's going to the All-Star game as a pitcher and a hitter. He's got more home runs than every other guy in baseball. I don't know how that's not a story. But baseball doesn't do a very good job at promoting their athletes and their stars. They just don't do a very good job of it. You got Mike Trout and you have Shohei Otani on the Angels. Would you know it? If I weren't sitting here telling you that, did you know that's that? Watch this. I'm almost bored again. You watch Shohei Otani. He's spectacular. This guy's a modern-day Babe Ruth, at least this year. This guy's got like under a two ERA or maybe a little bit over now, a two ERA. I think he got knocked around a little bit in his last outing. And he's leading the league in home runs. But watch this. Hey, that sounds got that sounds like a really that sounds like a good story. But is that gonna make me sit around watching the baseball all-star game? I don't know. You know, I'm I'm sitting here thinking, I don't know. Not sure. So that leads me into football now. And it leads me into something that has really been something for me that has been very, very cool to watch. I love Hard Knocks on HBO. By the way, today on our show, we will have our resident NFL insider, our friend, Pro Football Hall of Fame voter, Jason Cole, will join us. We'll get his spin if he thinks that this could be a distraction to the Cowboys season. Look, you ended up getting the Dak Prescott story out of the way. You signed him to the contract. You gave him his deal. You gave him his Brinks truck. Now, Jerry Jones brings in hard knocks for the third time. And will this be a distraction towards the 2021 season for the Cowboys? Which, by the way, if you look at their schedule, I think the Cowboys have a favorable schedule in the first two quarter pulls of the season. I think they have a chance to really win 10, 11 ball games this year because I don't think they have a very difficult schedule. So we'll talk to Jason. Also, speaking of hard knocks, the man who created it for HBO. You know, I mean, it's hard to believe that the Ravens were the first team and Marty Kallner, who's a legendary music video producer, director. He's worked with everybody from Chris Rock to Dave Chappelle to every single musician that you could possibly think of. I'm putting the greatest videos, music videos together in the history of the industry. And he is the creator of HBO's Hard Knocks. Marty Kallner will join us. That'll be in hour number two. Let's get into that now with the Cowboys. You know, I, I, I've always said this to you about the Dallas Cowboys. Jerry's brand of the Dallas Cowboys is the biggest brand in the world right now. There's no sports team including Manchester United, that is a bigger sports brand than the Dallas Cowboys. It has been an incredible marketing job from a man who knows how to market. He's taken all the things that made Al Davis, Al Davis, the old, old owner of the Oakland Raiders, and he has made his Dallas Cowboys the signature sports franchise, not in America, in the world, number one. And in that process, over the last 27 years since they won those three Super Bowls, they have not been back, not just to a Super Bowl, but they have not been back to an NFC championship game. The closest was a couple years ago when, if you remember right, remember the, the controversial catch or not catch in Green Bay, Des Bryant against the Packers. I thought it was a catch. I thought the Cowboys, that was probably their best team that they had had since the Jimmy Johnson teams. And they got jobbed out of that. And to me, I thought that that was a pretty good football team that they had there led by Tony Romo. Okay, that being said, it's been a priority for Jerry to expand that brand. Get this, and he's done it without winning and really being a dominant team like the New England Patriots. You would have thought this, with all the success that the New England Patriots had, that their brand would be the biggest brand on the planet because football now 
It's just dominating America. There's no other sport, really, that's in the conversation when we're talking about the NFL's popularity in America, right? You know, when I was a kid and for generations, baseball, America's pastime, all of that, it dominated the landscape of our sports world. That has gone away. I think since the strike of 94, baseball fans, I don't really think they ever really forgave. Steroid error, I thought was, watch this, you want to hear something crazy? I actually thought the steroid error brought fans back to the game. And then when they legislated the PEDs out of the sport, I think what you also did was you took fans and you took villains away from the sport. What makes a great league? Having heroes and villains. Baseball had villains. This guy's a juicer. Bonds is a juicer. Juan Gonzalez, juicer. All those, they were villains. And when they did that, they took all, A-Rod was a villain. They took all of those people out of the game. Now there's no heroes and villains. Football has those, don't they? You love or hate Tom Brady. Tom Brady could easily be the most popular player in the game and the most hated guy in the game. It's all about marketing. And to what Jerry Jones has done with his Cowboys, this is the third time now, as I said, that the Cowboys will be on hard knocks. Um, is it good for the team? We'll ask Jason Cole, as I said, at the bottom of the hour of this question. It doesn't matter. Jerry's concern about the Dallas Cowboys, I think, no longer is this. I don't think Jerry Jones looks at the Dallas Cowboys and goes like this. It's a priority for me to win a Super Bowl. Would it be great? Absolutely, it would be great. Absolutely. Okay? But is it a priority? They're the number one rated television football game every time they are on weekends. Nobody comes close. It's the Cowboys. Cowboys are the biggest rated team. Which means you're selling more jerseys. You're selling more merchandise. The brand is expanding. The wealth of the team gets bigger. Winning a Lombardi trophy? Remember something, folks. I know that everybody likes to tell you this is about winning. But isn't winning also winning at the cash register? You see, football fans are a grade up from wrestling fans. You're a grade up. You root for your favorite wrestler, right? But it's all a show. It's all about branding. It's all about marketing that brand for that wrestler, for the WWE. That's what it's about here. And the NFL looks at that and knows that as well as anybody. That's why they don't allow teams to wallow in their own misery for decades like they do in the NBA and baseball. You see teams that just suck out loud for like ever, like the Jets. In the NFL, they do everything in their power to help that Jets franchise. You can't help a football team that's got bad ownership, though. You just can't. And that's why some owners, they care about winning. Some owners care about making money. One of the richest owners is Shea Khan down in Jacksonville. Now, all of a sudden, he's been called on the carpet to win because he has his number one overall pick. And he has Trevor Lawrence, who just signed a $33.6 million guaranteed contract, which is great for that city and for that team and for that region. You got Urban Meyer in the building. We'll talk more about him later on whether or not I think he's going to have success. But Jerry Jones is winning every single day. Does it matter if it's a distraction? And really, in, 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 in terms of what's winning to you? See, Jerry wants his cake and eat it. He wants to win a Super Bowl, but he also wants to continue to expand the brand that he has bought. You got to remember something when he bought this team. Remember this. He bought the team for $154 million back in 1989 from Bum Bright. Even Donald Trump, who was looking at potentially buying the team, said Jones had overpaid it. He put every single nickel that he had, rubbed them together, and every single cent that he had to purchase that team. 
He had to put up 10%, so he put up $15 million of his money. Mortgaged every single thing he had. Everything. Brought in Jimmy Johnson. They win immediately, which all of a sudden gives that franchise a kick in the side and that had really suffered under the last couple of years of Coach Landry. And all of a sudden, that brand starts growing. Every year it grew. Every year, Jones was more out there. Reason why he's got his own radio show in Dallas. There's a reason why he's the face of the franchise. The face of the franchise is Jerry Jones. It's not Tony Romo. It's not Dak Prescott. It's Jerry Jones, even with the richest contract on the planet. It's Jerry Jones. And because Jerry Jones is the face of the, the, face of the franchise, that's why they're not going to win Super Bowls. That Dallas Cowboy team has no chance of winning a Super Bowl as long as Jerry is front and center in the face of the franchise. It's not so much that Jerry Jones has to stop being the general manager. He just has to stop being the face of the franchise. How many general managers can you name on one hand? It would start with Jerry. He's the only, well, here I'll go. Maybe Daniel Snyder is the face of that Washington team. Okay, but what's that meant? You know, Washington has had just a little bit less of success compared to what Jerry has. But Jerry knows how to sell it. Daniel Snyder doesn't. I mean, Washington is a great logo. It was, and it's a great brand. But Daniel Snyder doesn't know how to market it. Jerry did. And now they're going on hard knocks for a third time. Doesn't matter whether or not it's a distraction. That football team's not a Super Bowl contending team anyway. Can they win the NFC East? Sure. Okay. Great. But does that necessarily mean Jerry just has to have that team at 500? For it to be compelling. And watch this. Even if it's six and, or what is it now? Say they're now seven and 10. Doesn't matter. More people will talk about it. You know, it's funny. Krause and I and Cal, my team and I were talking about, you know, when the 76ers got bounced from the playoffs. Everybody in Philadelphia wanted Doc Rivers' head and Ben Simmons. This guy sucks. What the hell's going on in that front office? Daryl Morey, man. What are you doing? It made more content compelling. And by the way, I'm king of content. That, to me, is a great day. That's a great broadcasting day. You turn your mic on and you go. Because everyone else is going. Team wins. And kind of wins, it's like this. Oh, uh, well, you know, it's okay, you know. But when a team like lays an egg like that, it's compelling, especially in big markets, especially in passionate markets. Jerry's in one too with Dallas, but he controls the narrative. Them on hard knocks, hard knocks was made for the Cowboys. It was made for them. This is perfectly. This is a perfect script out of Hollywood. Jerry Jones signs the richest contract to a player in Dak Prescott. Now he's going to put his football team, which is the number one brand in the world, on hard knocks for a third time. Not even a Hollywood producer could have a better script than this. It's the ultimate reality show. Who do you think is going to be front and center when it comes to the television show, Hard Knocks? Jerry or Mike McCarthy? Mike McCarthy? He couldn't sell me a used car. That guy's got the personality of a rock. Mike McCarthy? Please don't. Hey, you want low ratings that night? Put Mike McCarthy on. You want high ratings? Put Jerry Jones on. Okay? Have him talk about. And by the way, you ready for this? Guess who's going to be doing the cutting? It's going to be Jerry calling guys into his office and telling them their dreams over. <laughs> I mean, right? So doesn't matter, man. We'll see what Jason says. We'll do that at the bottom of the hour here in a couple of minutes. All right. So I put a list together of players that I think are going to have bounce back years. And maybe you subscribe to this and maybe you don't. I've picked four guys. And 
Some of these guys are not my favorite players. But see, what I do is I give equal justice. Even though I may not like your attitude, but if I know that you're a highly skilled player, I'll still give you your kudos. I'm not one of these guys that, okay, when I see a great performance by somebody that I don't really subscribe to and how they handle their careers or how they handle their lives, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to be one of those old fart sports guys that's going to sit here and do this, try to jam a narrative down your throat just because I hate. Like, you know, when Skip Bayless tries to tell you that LeBron James sucks as a as, as a closeout player, even though he's got four NBA championships, what was it, like nine or ten years in a row he went to the NBA Finals? I mean, you, you tell a guy, dude, give it a rest. Your narrative is bad. <laughs> You're trying to jam something down people's throat that's not true, okay? And now, because people kind of go, Man, maybe he's not. You know, they didn't make the playoffs this year, even though they won the NBA championship a year ago, you know, out of sight, out of mind. So I'm not one of those guys. So I wrote four guys down here. And I think a lot of it's going to have to do with team success here. My first guy is Odell Beckham Jr. Odell Beckham Jr. knows this. He's got to have a massive year, not a good year, a massive year, an impact year. He could be on the number one roster in the NFL in the Browns. He could be. Will Baker Mayfield be able to get the football to him? Still a question that has not been answered since he's been in Cleveland. That football team is not built on throwing the ball anymore. That team is built on running the ball. So the big question will be, What's going to be his impact? If you're Kevin Stefanski, the uh, head coach of the Browns, are you really going to get away from a narrative that won you a boatload of games in the second half of the season after Beckham went down just so you can placate to that guy getting targets? Beckham is going to have to be a better teammate this year. And if he's a better teammate, you know what that may result in? Numbers getting back to where they were when he was in New York. But when you look at the first half numbers, Beckham may not have really giant numbers. He's going to have to be patient this year. I'm not sure he has that. But he knows in his mind, if they're going to move me or maybe there's another team out there, I've got to show for my next employer and my current employer that I'm a good teammate and that I can be an impact on the style of offense that they want to deliver each and every single Sunday. I'll finish who I think the other three are up. Don't forget, Jason Cole's right around the corner. We'll ask him about the Cowboys and hard knocks. Will that be a distraction in 2021? We'll do all that next. You keep it here on the National Football Show. I get scared sometimes. Of a lot of things. Joining in. Decisions. The dark. The dark. But I once heard someone say. But as I always say. It's okay to be afraid. As long as you face the fear. And keep moving forward. Wherever you are in life, count on the name trusted in insurance for over 80 years. Independence Blue Cross. Ah, the savoring taste of a good bag of beef jerky is so enjoyable at any time of the day, as long as you can find it. Here's what we suggest. Pure Bull Beef Jerky is our answer, and soon it will be yours. Locally produced in the Philadelphia region, this high-quality, healthy protein snack is easy to secure. Go to Steersnacks.com, and you'll see hot garlic, tropical heat, Pure Bull Dry Rub, and our favorite, Huck and Fod. What's that? Huck and Fod. Go now to Steersnacks.com. Welcome to the Wildwoods, the perfect place where you can safely do everything or nothing at all. Catch a wave, take a nap, go for a drive, grab a bite. It's your vacation, and we're doing everything we can to make it a safe one. The Wildwoods. Your vacation, your way. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 98, is a proud sponsor of The Labor Show with J. Doc and Krause every Saturday night from 6 to 8 p.m. IBEW Local 98's highly trained and superbly skilled electricians are the best in the business, setting the highest safety standards in the electrical industry. So when you're planning your next industrial, commercial, or residential project, choose an IBEW Local 98 union contractor. Learn more at IBEW98.org.
field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. This is a key. It's a family tree. It's a pair of wings. It's a secret handshake. And a ticket to anywhere in the world. It's more than a uniform. It's the door to a world most people only dream of. There's strong, and then there's army strong. Try it on at GoArmy.com. Welcome back to the National Football Show. Dan Cilio, Jason Cole right around the corner. Our NFL insider, Pro Football Hall of Fame voter. Marty Kalner, too, in hour two, the creator of HBO's Hard Knocks, will join us. I was looking at the 2021 guys that I think are going to have comeback player of the year capabilities. And I just mentioned Odell Beckham Jr. He's going to have to be patient if he's going to want to be a factor on that Browns team. The Browns have a remedy now to win. Run the ball. Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt and the number one rated offensive line in the NFL. I mean, why would you get away from that just so you could target Odell Beckham? Makes no sense. The running game is going to open that up for Beckham, but will Beckham be patient? We're going to get a good sense of who Kevin Stefanski is now because he's going to have to manage that ego. You got two egos in the room now. One's a very young one in Baker Mayfield, and the other one is one that's set in his ways in Odell Beckham Jr. Patience is going to have to play out here for him if he's going to be an impact player on this team. And how about this? If the Browns want to continue to go forward with him or maybe send him someplace that a football team needs a star wide receiver with a star quarterback. I mean, has Beckham done enough for them to send uh, him to a place, I don't know, like Miami. Could that help to a tug of Viola out? I don't know. Would you send him to a place like Green Bay? Not that Green Bay does stuff like that. So we'll see what Beckham does. The other guy, in my opinion, is going to be Christian McCaffrey. I can't wait to see what Christian McCaffrey does with Sam Darnold down in Carolina. Christian McCaffrey has really surprised me in how he runs the football inside and his – Pass catching abilities on being able to get out of the perimeter. There's a reason why he's the highest paid running back in the National Football League. He missed last year, obviously, due to injuries. Um, I think he's going to come back even stronger than he did before. And now you put him in that Matt Rule offense. If Sam Darnold is anything on what we projected when he came out of Southern Cal, you could look at a surprise team here. When we're talking about Carolina, we'll continue my surprise, guys. We'll bring in our guy now and our dear friend here, Jason Cole. He joins us now. Jace, hopefully you had a great 4th of July weekend, brother. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, man, I saw you tweeting out something on Reggie Bush, and there's a big – no. I, and you know what? I don't know if we disagree or agree, or maybe it's just a method that Reggie is using, in case those out there don't know. Reggie is now – um, he's like out there – you know, being a politician trying to get his Heisman Trophy back. And from what I'm understanding, the Heisman Poli Trust No, no, he's not being a politician. No, he's being an advocate. <laughs> okay, an advocate. <laughs> For himself. <laughs> to try to get his Heisman Trophy back. And the Heisman Trust has come out saying, okay, if the NCAA reinstates his records and his numbers, they would give him back his trophy. Are you a fan of this? Yeah, I have no problem with this. I mean, look, I – and just so everybody understands, I took I took Reggie's Heisman from him. Okay, I'm one. Of, <laughs> okay, I'm one of the two reporters who investigated Reggie. I'm me and Charles Robinson at Yahoo Sports. And when I say I took it from him, I mean I took it from him. I like, get it. My investigation, you know, robbed him of that Heisman. But I said it back then, you know, 15 years ago, and I'll say it now. The rules are crap. Um. What the NCA was allowed to do in determining what he could or couldn't make are crap. And the Supreme Court of this country <laughs> agrees with me. Okay. <laughs> so I was always in the right. He broke the rules. The rules were bad. And part of my intention in all this was to 
hopefully get to this point along the way. And I remember talking to college presidents along the way about, you know, look, your rules are antiquated. And I talked to Mark Embert about this. And he goes, well, we have a right to do You have no right to do this. You're, you're just, your right has not been questioned, okay, adequately. You don't really have a right. You're wrong in this one. Kids should be able to control their name, their image, and their likeness, okay? That is not given away just because you hand them a scholarship, all right? And ultimately, I, you know, I think a lot of NIL is overblown. But to keep it on Reggie, Reggie was subject to, to crappy rules run by a crappy institution, led by a crappy human being in Mark Emmert. And they should have changed this a long time ago. He should still have his Heisman. Now, my problem with Reggie a little bit is he's not being completely forthright and honest about this. He's avoiding, like he wants to kind of cleverly avoid, oh, you know, uh, you know I, I didn't do anything wrong to the game. Look, dude, you brazenly took that money, okay? I proved it again and again. I got your signature on documents. I, got, I proved it again and again, multiple times over that you took this cash and you knew that you were breaking the rules, okay? You knew what you were doing. Have the guts to also stand up and say, this has been a bad rule for decades. I suffered because of it. I hope kids don't suffer in the future. Speak up for people, you know, and other people in the past. Don't just advocate for yourself because you want your Heisman back, because you want the trophy and you want all the money that goes with it. That's, that's the problem I got with Reggie, but he deserves to have the Heisman back. I give it back to him. Is the questionable stuff, was it $300,000 in cash in a home? Is that what was, well, was in his cash, relationship? It was a house. It was rent. It was a car. It was, I mean, it was furniture. It was travel expenses. I mean, come on. It was, it was everything. It was, it, you know, he was, he was taking from two different people. Like he had two different marketing guys, right. Who were angling for him as a client. Okay. One of them, Gave him three hundred thousand. The other one, Mike Ornstein, who you and I both know, yep. and I like Orny. Okay, yep. yeah, Orny's, yep. you know, Orny's Orny. Okay, yep. everybody in the NFL knows who Orny is. Yep. But he was giving him cash too. Okay, he gave him a lot of money as well. So he he cashed in big time. But from the one one side, the guys in San Diego, they gave him three hundred thousand bucks between free rent, house. Fixed up a car. They took a what was it like a 1996 Impala and they tricked it out. Um, they sent him to the Venetian Hotel for a weekend in Las Vegas. They did all sorts of stuff. Sent his his parents went to went to Hawaii for a game. And his parents, you know, his parents are both uh, security guards at the time. Okay, they didn't make the kind of money to be traveling all over the country, um, you know, and all over the world watching their kid play. And, and the thing about it is they should have been able to do that. Like Reggie should have been able to make the kind of money to allow his parents to go watch him. Okay. You know, he, he shouldn't have had to surrender that because they, of these antiquated NCAA rules. He should have been allowed to, to, you know, at, le at least go borrow money from a bank on his future earnings. That should have been allowed um, or to make commercials or to do whatever. I mean, he was worth millions of dollars at USC. And he was never never able to cash in on that. So, you know, I just always looked at this as um, this was a referendum as much on on Reggie and the sort of, you know, just asinine ways that they went about taking this money and flaunting it. It was as much about that as it was about the NCAA and their stupid rules. That's to me, me. And I wrote it. Let me let me ask you this then. You know, Jace, I said this this past Friday about this then too. I was like, okay, well, if now we're going to allow kids to be able to control their ability to make money off their likeness and being uh -huh. able to potentially get endorsements on this, which you're seeing a lot of kids starting to do now, um, what's the purpose of the NCAA now moving forward? Kind of regulate leagues, I guess. I don't know. But... Wow. Uh, well, doesn't this, because they can't control the kids any longer, doesn't this cripple well, it, it their away. strength? Yeah, I mean, it, it takes away a lot of their power. I think Paul Feinbaum has said, you know, the NCA is 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 no longer isn't useful anymore. I mean, I think you have to have a, a essentially some kind of regulatory agency to to make sure that the rules are taken care of. It's like, look, the NFL has thirty two different. But how teams. about a commissioner, Jace? Why not just have a regular commissioner? Why are they so afraid to look like the NFL? 
Oh, I don't know if they're afraid of I, Look, <laughs> they're afraid of losing power. There's no question about that. And if you've ever been in the NCAA offices, those are nice offices. Oh, yes. They're really nice. They're, they, uh, they, 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 the floors are made out of hardwood that look like a basketball court, right? Because they make a lot of money on, on, you know, on the NCAA tournament. Um, there's a lot of chairs that look like they're made out of leather from footballs because they make a lot of money off of football, right? I, like there's a lot of money there. And so people are protecting their little fiefdom. I get that. And I think, again, you have to have some kind of commissioner. You have to have some su- kind of support group similar to the NFL. Is that the NCAA or is it some college administrative association? You know, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, you need to have something. And there are still rules that have to be, uh, you know, there are still rules about in season that have to be taken care of. There's no question about that. And there are other rules that go beyond name, image, and likeness that have to be controlled. Um, so there's some enforcement that, that still occurs. But the biggest element of enforcement, which is the ability of a kid to make money off of his name, image, and likeness, that one's gone. And they need to to gut that. And they've only had to gut it now because the Supreme Court and states in this country have said, A, you're wrong, and B, we're changing the rules on you. We're allowing our athletes in our states, like Florida and California, North Carolina, a bunch of other ones, to go make money on their name, image, and likeness. And you can't, as an, as the NCAA, you can't stop us. Let's go into the NFL here. Hard Knocks now is going to put the Cowboys on for a third time. Is this a distraction that's not needed? Or, again, how do you see this playing out? Or do you even think Hard Knocks is a distraction? Um, look, if I was running a football team, I wouldn't want to have a ton of people with cameras in my in my building. <laughs> okay. I mean, right. I, I just like it's not my thing. <laughs> I, I, I I don't think it affects whether you win or lose. Um, I think that Jerry loves it. Okay, because Jerry wants like look, Jerry never met a camera he didn't like. Um, yeah, you know, Jerry wants to make as much money. He wants he Jerry cares more about the brand of the Cowboys than about actually winning with the Cowboys. Okay, <laughs> and that's and that's. Like that's the bottom line, and that's why that team is worth what they're worth about five million dollars, and that's five probably billion dollars, right? On. Five, yeah, five billion. I'm sorry, five billion dollars. I mean, um, right? Like he's been an incredibly successful businessman. That, that's one of the reasons why I voted for him to go to the Hall of Fame. I mean, he's the P.T. Barnum of the NFL. He's a genius when it comes to when it comes to business. When it comes to winning football games, that's a different matter. So you think it's more, and I've said you're, you're. I think you're dead on with this, Jace. I think it's more important when you wear the star of the cowboy that mm-hmm. he looks at his players as being TV stars, and that is bigger because he's winning because the cash register is moving. Like you said, he buys the team for 150 million dollars. The team's worth five billion dollars, but that's okay. The team's worth <laughs> the team's worth five billion dollars today. I mean, he's winning, even not go, getting back to these NFC Championship games. So I do think. The branding of the team is more important than winning those Super Bowls for him now. Yeah, that's been – well, I don't know if it's now. Look, I, I do think that part of Jerry desperately wants to win a Super Bowl and has wanted to desperately win a Super Bowl. And and as the clock ticks towards, you know, he's not going to live forever. And we saw this go happen with Al Davis. Al Davis got increasingly desperate as time went on. Um, look, Jerry wants to win that Super Bowl. That's edification for himself, Right that he's the one who masterminded them winning the Super Bowl. He does want that. He can't help himself, okay? It is too ingrained in who he is to not want to make money. All right? And I remember sitting in Jerry's car. Jerry gave me a tour of the old building one day, right? I mean, I'm sorry, not the old building, the new building. He's in his car, and they're in construction, and he's telling me about we went to, you know, we went overseas, we went to Italy to see the Roman Coliseum and do this and do that, and, you know, he's giving me the spiel and this and that. And we started talking about, you know, how he ended up being, you know, in business rather than being in football because he said, you know, when he was a senior in college, you know, he was looking going, yeah, I think I'm, you know, I'd like to coach and maybe be involved in football. And they go, and this is what he said. He goes, then I found out how much money coaches made. And I said, I can't do that. <laughs> so, right. Like he wants to make money more than he wants to be great at football. And that's like, I don't blame him for that. Um, 
but it's sort of not the point of why we do this. Absolutely. Let me get over to a comment that you made and let me get your thoughts on Nick Sariani. You're on with our guys that's that are in the morning, the birds, and you think he's in over his head, huh? You think Sirianni is because listen, and Chase, I take your your views and how you see this league because you've been covering it for decades and right. you've run into all types of coaches. Some again, some you know, the zebra doesn't change their stripes. There's guys that remind you of certain people and their behaviors on how you see this. So, you know, your assessment on what you've seen so far, you're not a fan, huh? Well, I think, you know, initial reactions and statements are are pretty telling. He he reminds me of um, Marty Morningweg as a coach, as a head coach. And Marty's a really smart guy. But some guys are meant to be coordinators. Some guys are great lieutenants. You knew Dave wants that, right? Yeah, we have yeah, and you like Dave. Um, I love him. I think, Dave, I, I think Dave is a blithering idiot as a head coach, okay? And we don't have to have a big, long discussion, but you understand what I'm saying. His record, because, his record says to what you – again, I'd like to argue with you, but I can't. Right. Okay. Um, I think he was incapable of being a head coach. But as a lieutenant for Jimmy Johnson, when Jimmy is the bad cop and Dave wants it's the good cop and you're trying to get the defense to play together and all those kinds of things, Dave wants that was perfect in that role. He was, he was great in that role. Nick Sirianni, I, I feel the same kind of thing. Is he smarter than Dave wants that? Probably. Okay. That's not a high bar in my view. Okay. Um, is he a leader of men that you're looking and going, Oh yeah, I'm going to rally behind him. doesn't sound like it to me. But the one critical thing, and this is the part I don't know, okay, and he can overcome this, is when he's in a meeting, okay, and when he's out on the field and he's making decisions, is he doing things, okay, that the players are going, that's making me better, right? That's going to help me win games. And if he can do that, if he can convince guys that you're going to win games because of the the decisions that I make and the way that I help you as a player, okay, then he's going to be a great coach. If he can't do that, he's going to be a terrible coach. It's that simple because the people that you have to get to buy in aren't the fans. It's the players. The players have to believe in what you're, what you're selling and the players have to believe that you're going to win and you're going to lead them to victory because as soon as they don't believe that, and you know this again, better than I do. If you don't think a coach can help you, you ain't listening to him anymore. Shutting out. You you turn you turned him off. You're like I gotta get somebody else. This guy's not good enough. Jace, I want to get into a pretty tough topic here, and you know I think media sometimes they, you know, when they hear an athlete say something, they sometimes gloss over things. And when I heard Aaron Rodgers say something, see to me at times I struggle with depression as well, mm -hmm. and I heard Aaron Rodgers saying he was working on mental health, and I was thinking to myself, okay. Working on mental health. Again, man, he's not the same cracker in the box, so to mm -hmm. speak, that everybody is expecting these quarterbacks to be. Everybody right. has a different way that they're wound. You know what I'm saying, Jace? Sure. And so yeah. it's not for us to understand it. It's for us to listen to it and to kind of comprehend the way he is as a person. That gave mm -hmm. me a little bit different of a perspective on the guy. Do I think he's Tom Brady mentally? Absolutely not. Do I think he's Russell Wilson? Do I think he's the greatest thrower of the football? I do, actually. But all those things are what make Aaron Rodgers Aaron Rodgers. And so I just wonder if it changed your perspective at all about him at all, or did you just look at that as just an Aaron Rodgers excuse? How did you perceive that comment? No, I didn't look at it as an excuse. Um, and it doesn't change the way I feel about Aaron Rodgers or think about Aaron Rodgers because I've always thought that Aaron is different. Um you can't help but look at the way that he acts and say, this is a different guy. Okay. He takes things very personally. I mean, there's a re there's a reason that he is estranged from his parents and from his brothers. Okay. There's a reason that he cuts a lot of people off. Okay. There's a reason why he can be very prickly at times. Now I like Aaron a lot. I've had nothing but good experiences with him. But I will say this, like I may try to make a joke with him one time about Stanford Cal. 
And I looked at him, and you know, Stanford's won like nine out of the last ten big games, right? And he's a Cal grad, and I'm a Stanford grad, so I give him a little kind of poke, right? Because we'd won four <laughs> or five in a row by that time. Right. I go, yeah, yeah, like, and I just I can't remember what I said, but it was something like just a joke, and he gave me this glare, and like seriously, like he, he was, it was, it was that like, what are you talking about? We're gonna kick your, you know. You know, like it it was a super competitive glare, right? And I'm just some schmo reporter who <laughs> likes to joke around with him, right? <laughs> but it gave me a little glimpse into his character and what he's like. And that he does not take slights lightly. Okay. He does not tolerate fools lightly. He does not tolerate what happened in the NFC championship game this last year lightly. He remembers the game at Seattle where Mike McCarthy didn't coach very well in the second half where they should have beat Seattle and gone on to the Super Bowl. He, those things are just deep in his soul. So when he's talking about, you know, working on his mental health and taking a different approach and all those other things, man, I, he, he's an introspective guy. He's a deep dude. Okay, I'm fascinated by yes. by Aaron Rodgers and what he and what he does and thinks, and I realize that some of it works to make him truly great, and some of it undermines him. Some of that, some of that that pushes him to greatness is also the thing that destroys him sometimes. Absolutely, I think that's a great perspective on Aaron Rodgers. Finally, here, you are a Hall of Fame voter. Why? I want to throw this at you here when it comes to Don Coriel. Why not put him in a contributors category instead? If he can't get in as a guy who has enough wins or whatever that parameter is for certain people, you've got a contributor um, category now. You don't think that Don Coriel has contributed to the way offenses, and I don't, I'm not saying you, Jace, but mm -hmm. I can't think how people don't think that Don Coriel's style of football didn't have an impact on <laughs> Bill Walsh or the way we Joe see Gibbs. The, How about Joe, Joe Gibbs? Gibbs per perfect, okay? How's he not at least looked at in a way to try to get him in to fame because of his contribution? Uh, look, I, in the nine years I've done it, I think we've talked about Coriel three times, maybe four. Okay, huh. I can't, I'd have to look look at it. And you know, previously he was in with the players, and we do now have the contributors category, and he goes in that category. Um, I will say that somehow in 2020, Don Coriel was inexplicably jumped by Bill Cower and a coach you know very well, Jimmy Johnson. Uh, Jimmy, we had discussed before. Bill Cower had never been discussed in the room and wow. jumped um, some people. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. um, in this, they had this special blue ribbon panel discussion group that was separate from the voters that year. And I don't want to get into too deep a detail, but, you know, somehow the one guy who works on CBS on a Saturday and the other guy who works on Fox on a Sunday um, got into the Hall of Fame and those announcements were made on TV. You think those you think the pressure from the networks? I didn't say anything uh, pressured, like that. pressured the blue ribbon people to put Jimmy. I, I didn't in say it. anything like that. Did I? Nope. I just said that a couple of guys. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. You said that. OK, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Hey, this is why I freaking love you. This is why I love you, man. This is why I love you, Jason Cole. You are my favorite guy that I get on my program, brother. I love you, man. Thank you so much, Jason. Anytime, dude. Be good. You got Thanks. it, man. That is Jason Cole. Jason didn't say it. I said it. Interesting. The Blue Ribbon panel last year. possibly, in my opinion, could have had an influence on Cower and Johnson going into the Hall of Fame. And they were mentioned, they were mentioned on the air live at CBS and on Fox. We'll take a time out to keep it here on the National Football Show. I get scared sometimes. Of a lot of things. Joining in. Decisions. The dark. The dark. But I once heard someone say. But as I always say. 
It's okay to be afraid. As long as you face the fear. And keep moving forward. Wherever you are in life, count on the name trusted in insurance for over 80 years. Independence Blue Cross. Ah, the savoring taste of a good bag of beef jerky is so enjoyable at any time of the day, as long as you can find it. Here's what we suggest. Pure Bull Beef Jerky is our answer, and soon it will be yours. Locally produced in the Philadelphia region, this high-quality, healthy protein snack is easy to secure. Go to Steersnacks.com, and you'll see hot garlic, tropical heat, Pure Bull Dry Rub, and our favorite, Huck and Fod. What's that? Huck and Fod. Go now to Steersnacks.com. Welcome to the Wildwoods, the perfect place where you can safely do everything or nothing at all. Catch a wave, take a nap, go for a drive, grab a bite. It's your vacation, and we're doing everything we can to make it a safe one. The Wildwoods. Your vacation, your way. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 98, is a proud sponsor of The Labor Show with J. Doc and Krause every Saturday night from 6 to 8 p.m. IBEW Local 98's highly trained and superbly skilled electricians are the best in the business, setting the highest safety standards in the electrical industry. So when you're planning your next industrial, commercial, or residential project, choose an IBEW Local 98 union contractor. Learn more at IBEW98.org. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. This is a key. It's a family tree. It's a pair of wings. It's a secret handshake. And a ticket to anywhere in the world. It's more than a uniform. It's the door to a world most people only dream of. There's strong, and then there's army strong. Try it on at GoArmy.com. Welcome back to the National Football Show, Dan Cilio. Want to get to a couple topics here before the top of the hour. We take another time out. Then we're going to have Marty Kallner from HBO's Hard Knocks. He's the creator. Get his thoughts. What was the inspiration for Hard Knocks? One of the best shows ever when it comes to reality television, when it comes to football. And we'll talk to Marty. That'll be in hour number two. Very interesting comments by Jason Cole. I mean, Blue Ribbon Panel, the stuff on Nick Sirianni. Reggie Bush, he and his investigation was part of the reason why Reggie lost his Heisman. I thought that was interesting. And don't forget, if you miss any of the show, you can go over to the Jacob Media channel and you can like and share the show too. So, you know, I was talking before we brought Jason on, on comeback players that I'm looking at going into the 2021 season. I, I, I mentioned Odell Beckham Jr. I think patience is going to be a priority for him in the first two quarter polls of the season. You know, halfway through the year, he's going to have to be patient and fit him. He's got to fit himself into that offense, not the Browns fitting him in. You know what I mean? He's got to find his role. And that's what good football teams do. You find your role on a team. Nothing's handed to you. Christian McCaffrey, I'm going to be very interested to see how he works his way in to the Matt Rule offense. And if Sam Darnold can get him the football, Sam Darnold could just have to sit back there and just get him the ball. Let McCaffrey go out there and just run wild. And if he can make any plays on third down, that is going to move the sticks on that team. And you could have a surprise football team in Carolina this year. I think their defense needs still a little bit more work. Their offensive line has some question marks on it. And you're talking about big play opportunities on the perimeter. I don't know if they have it. But those are the kind of teams with weaker schedule, 
not a lot of expectations. Those are the teams that sneak up on you and could go nine and eight or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Ten and seven. Uh, they're they're surprised. Somebody's going to be a surprise team in the NFC South this year. So maybe it's Carolina. I picked four guys. I got this other kid here. I think Nick Bozum. I think he's a spectacular talent. I think his brother is too, Joey, with the Chargers. But I think if you can get – and it's funny, the last two guys, and I'll kind of bury the lead here on my last guy. The last two guys are 49ers. I'll make this point to you. Maybe we'll just combine them right now. I think Jimmy G's the other guy. So my four guys are going to be Odell Beckham, McCaffrey, Nick Boza, and Jimmy G. These are going to be my comeback player of the year candidates. And let me just say this to you. If Nick Boza gets back to being Nick Boza – a year ago, and Jimmy G gets back to being the he was that has a 22-8 and record as a starting quarterback for the 49ers. 49ers will be in the Super Bowl again. They have a ready-made team, and most importantly, what's the number one thing that I always tell you about when it comes to building a football team? They have got the equity at depth. That football team has created the depth because they've drafted and they've brought guys in to be able to fill that roster out that can contribute to that football roster. I tell people this all the time. Having high draft choices on your football team sometimes can be a detriment. Why? Because you got to pay them. And you can't fit everybody under the salary cap, especially as the cap came back a little bit this year because of the pandemic. You know, it was about 206 and it came back to 181. And they lost a boatload of money on being able to manipulate that roster. So they had to get rid of really good football players. And that affects your special teams. That affects the depth on many football teams. That's why you saw a bunch of good guys out there in the free agent market that were able to get snapped up and made football teams better this past this past offseason. And the team that to me, has done a whale of a job at putting together all of the components that you need to really have a stout roster, not just a stout 22. Hey, look, the Buccaneers, here, here's the issue in Tampa. Tampa has an issue. Tampa's issue is their first 22 are the best in the league. My question is going to be when you pay all those guys, those front 22 guys, who's behind them? You know, when you start dealing all the cash out and you got to start paying all these guys, especially some of the young guys that are on that football team. And you got to start divvying out the cash that affects your roster in many ways. And if it affects guys after 25 and I mean, 25, 25 men probably on the roster are true contributors each and every single Sunday to an NFL football team. Okay. All that being said, Your other guys, 47 active, 53 on your team, those guys are what make your depth up in case you have a catastrophic injury. Or look at what happened to Kansas City in the Super Bowl as they got into the playoffs. Their tackles ended up getting banged up. They had no depth at that position because they were paying everybody on the defensive side of the football and people in the skilled positions like, you know, Kelsey and Hill and those type of players. They were paying those guys that money. Chris Jones on the defensive side. You've, this was the secret sauce, as I always say to people. This was the secret sauce to New England. Every, did you not notice every single time a guy's contract that was a good football player came up? What did New England do? You were either going to not take top dollar, to remain there and win, or they were going to move you for ads. Look at Chandler Jones. Look at what they did with Randy Moss and even uh, Terrell Rivas. Every single time, uh, Terrell Rivas, every single time that somebody's contract came up, they were going to have that conversation with you. Either you're going to be part of this or we are going to move on from you and we'll get assets. Because you know why? The Patriots can't lose in that. They've already built up enough equity when it comes to the roster and the depth, and that's how they are just brilliant at building that. And, of course, you had Brady, which gave you that latitude, especially in the first four years. Remember, they didn't have to pay Brady all that money. Same thing in Seattle. When There's a reason why Seattle was so good in the early part of Russell Wilson's career. Why? 
he was making less money than the backup quarterback. So the equity. If Jimmy Garoppolo and Nick Bozum are healthy and have star years, 49ers will be in a Super Bowl, not just the NFC Championship game. That could be who Tampa plays in the NFC title game. The San Francisco 49ers. How appropriate would that be for Brady? Brady beats the Niners. Okay, and he goes into another Super Bowl and calls it a career. That would be one way to bow out. All right. Trey Lance said something that was so cool to the 49ers. I got a great, a great story that's coming out of San Francisco, and I'm going to give you my prediction on whether or not I think Urban Meyer makes it as an NFL head coach. We'll do that next. You keep it here on the National Football Show. I get scared sometimes. Of a lot of things. Joining in. Decisions. The dark. The dark. But I once heard someone say. But as I always say. It's okay to be afraid. As long as you face the fear. And keep moving forward. Wherever you are in life, count on the name trusted in insurance for over 80 years. Independence Blue Cross. Ah, the savoring taste of a good bag of beef jerky is so enjoyable at any time of the day, as long as you can find it. Here's what we suggest. Pure Bull Beef Jerky is our answer, and soon it will be yours. Locally produced in the Philadelphia region, this high-quality, healthy protein snack is easy to secure. Go to Steersnacks.com, and you'll see hot garlic, tropical heat, Pure Bull Dry Rub, and our favorite, Huck and Fod. What's that? Huck and Fod. Go now to Steersnacks.com. Welcome to the Wildwoods, the perfect place where you can safely do everything or nothing at all. Catch a wave, take a nap, go for a drive, grab a bite. It's your vacation, and we're doing everything we can to make it a safe one. The Wildwoods, your vacation, your way. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 98, is a proud sponsor of The Labor Show with J. Doc and Krause every Saturday night from 6 to 8 p.m. IBEW Local 98's highly trained and superbly skilled electricians are the best in the business, setting the highest safety standards in the electrical industry. So when you're planning your next industrial, commercial, or residential project, choose an IBEW Local 98 union contractor. Learn more at IBEW98.org. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Seven, one, three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. This is a key. It's a family tree. It's a pair of wings. It's a secret handshake. And a ticket to anywhere in the world. It's more than a uniform. It's the door to a world most people only dream of. There's strong, and then there's Army strong. Try it on at GoArmy.com. Welcome back. Hour two here on the National Football Show. Your boy, Dan Cilio. Bottom of the hour, we will talk to the creator of HBO's Hard Knocks. That'll be Marty Kallner. What was the inspiration for this great series? It's greatest reality TV show. Man, I'll tell you something. Getting called into a coach's office to be released or cut is really something that is just a gut punch here. Let me, let me give you my experiences with this. I've had the highs and lows being drafted high and being cut. My first one was with Ray Perkins of the Buccaneers. A lot of that was my fault. You know, I had a lot to do with 
how I approach the game and how I approach my preparation and just angry on it. And it was such a crappy organization. The Bucks were going nowhere under a racist owner in Hugh Culverhouse. He's such a crappy owner. His lieutenant, Phil Kruger, these guys were just, they were just so unholy in how they ran their team. And I did not understand that I needed to be more mature to understand that and to manage them. And it got the best of me. So when Ray called me in his office and cut me, I didn't really care. I thought it was just going to be, I'll get picked up in 10 seconds because everybody knows how crappy the organization is. Little did I realize when you're cut from the crappiest organization, a lot of people will tag you with that. Well, couldn't make the Bucks. How's he going to make the 49ers, right? Or Cleveland. It, it's a little different today. People get second opportunities today because they see finally that, hey, sometimes organizations are the root of all evil when it comes to developing talent. We see that all the time. Ryan Tannehill is the greatest example of this now. Or how about this? Even Kurt Warner, who we had on the program a couple months ago, Kurt Warner was cut five times. How about this? You want to even go down and, you know, talk about some of the – James Harrison was cut five times. This guy's going to Canton. Yeah, that James Harrison. Guy played with the Steelers. He was cut five times. Was with – the Ravens had him. Think of that for a minute. You imagine him and Suggs and Reed and Ray Lewis, and you just caught him because whatever. You didn't see it? So – Today, the players get more of an opportunity. Man, when you're back in my time and they cut you, you were it was a hard climb back up that mountain. That's why I had to go to off league, CFL, World League, Arena League, just to get seven years in. So that was a release that I, I wanted out of there anyway. I was I went from winning all those football games with the Miami Hurricanes to go with the Bucks, and I lost career. I tell people this. I lost more games in one year in Tampa. We lost 12 games than I did my entire college and high school career combined. And when you're not prepared for that, and I wasn't, which is on me, um, boy, that's a stab in the heart. And then when you have poor coaches on top of that, there's no way to win. So then I get to Dallas. Coach Landry brings me in. They were getting ready to change the entire um, defense around. They were going to go to a nose guard defense. They were in that old school flex defense, and they were going to go to a nose. So they they basically went right after me. They said, hey, we'd like to – they gave me like $35,000 on a signing bonus, which for a guy being cut was pretty good. And it was probably the most money that I was offered the Cowboys. And Tex Schramm offered me that. I talked to Tex. They brought me in and they said, listen, we think you and Danny Noonan can handle the duties here in Dallas for us, for the nose guard for the next couple of years. And I was brought in. They were going to go to a 3-4 defense. So I was explicitly brought in for that. They brought me in. They signed me in November. So I was on the roster. I was on the team in November of 88. And I finished out that year on the Cowboys in 88. Fast forward, Jimmy Johnson and Jerry buy the team, or Jimmy coaches the team and Jerry buys the team. They were going to stick with the Ford defensive front. I figured, well, I got a chance of making this team anyway because I played for Jimmy. I got hurt. I blew my calf out. I still tried to push through it. They wanted me, get this. This is the dumbest move I ever made in my life. Jimmy Johnson goes like this to me. He's like, listen, we want to keep you on the team. Pretend a sniper shot you. I'm like, what? This is what they say, sniper. So if you ever hear this term sniper in an exhibition game, that means they're trying to put that guy in injured reserve to hide him for another year. Sniper got him. It's a NFL old school term on how you hit people on injured reserve. Sniper hit him. And so Jimmy goes, let the sniper hit you. I'm like, man, I'm good enough to make this team. I, I, he's like, do you want to be on this team or not? Sure enough, I couldn't go down. Cost myself a spot on the Dallas Cowboys. 
Jimmy said, called me in the office. You're not the same. Your injuries precluding you from being who you are. You know how much I love you. You know how friends, friends will be forever. I held this against Jimmy Johnson for 10 years. I did. I was so pissed and hurt that he cut me. He knew the player I was, but he cut me anyway. And he told me, I gave you a chance to make the team. We would have kept you and we would have rehabbed your leg. You'd probably been on this team my entire time in Dallas. That was on me. Again, another silly-o-ism. And my last Dallas Cow or my last NFL being cut was the worst one because I had gone to the World League. The NFL had a thing called the World League. And I'm talking about hard knocks and how these coaches have to call you in their office to cut you. And I'll never forget, I, I played so well in this world. Like, and by the way, I was out of the game for three years. I hadn't played in three years. And somebody convinced me to go try to do it one last time. I mean, I was out. This was like, I think I was 28, something like that, 20, 29, something like that. And I said, man, I don't know. And so I go to this team called the Orlando Thunder, the Detroit Lions had designated me at a guy as they might want me to be on their team after the world league year. So I'm like, man, I have been out of the game three years. And I'm telling you folks out of the game for three years, my coach's name was Galen Hall. He had coached to get uh, the Florida Gators. And by the way, he was Joe Paterno's final offensive coordinator in happy Valley. Cause he had quarterback. I think he was coach Paterno's quarterback back at Penn state. And I had played against Galen's Gator teams, and I loved Galen Hall. Galen was such a great dude, man. I didn't know him very well, but he knew who I was, obviously, because the rivalry, Miami and Florida. And we had played back then every year, first game of the year. They don't do that any longer. So he, he, he takes me. I think he took me in the 17th round of that draft. And he, he goes, well, I just took a flyer on you to see if you were good. And you are. You're just not in shape. Man, it took me everything to get into shape. Well, fast forward, I get to the championship game. I make second team all world league. Every NFL team's talking to me. The Lions have my rights. So the Lions bring me in. I had played a 13 game schedule. I had one week to heal before I went into training camp with the Lions. I was like, holy cow. So I went right from that league every day pounding in the Florida heat to Detroit. I get up there. I start every single game in the exhibition season. I have a great exhibition year. And this is how we know Kevin Colbert. Kevin Colbert was one of the assistants in the personnel department then. And this is hard knocks at its best. You're not going to Ron Hughes has just passed away. One of the great personnel guys. And this is how I know Ron and Kevin Colbert and Rick Spielman, who is also, who's now the general manager of the Vikings. And I played with his brother, Chris Spielman. So Ron Hughes, man, last cuts come. Everybody's been cut. They knock on my door. And he, Ron Hughes goes like this, the GM of the team. Listen, don't hit me. You're good enough to be on this team. You're good enough to be in this league. He goes, I want you to go to the coach, um, Fonts, Wayne Fonts, and I want you to tell him why you want to be on this team. I'm like, man, you're really – he goes, bring your playbook, man. Just do me a favor. Lamar Leachman, the D-line coach, made a pitch for me. They wanted me on the team instead of this guy, Lawrence Pete. I was going to back Jerry Ball up. This is so hard knocks. And so I'm like this. And Chris goes, do it, do it. You belong on this team. So I go, okay, man. So I walk in and Fonts sitting behind his desk. He goes, listen, this is the toughest cut I've had since I've been head coach. Lawrence is my guy. I drafted him out of Nebraska. I'm going with him. But keep stand by. We want you to stay in Detroit. He goes, and we'll pay you under the table. I said, you're kidding me. 
So Lawrence gets hurt. They activate me for a game. Okay. Next week calls me in and goes, we're going with Lawrence. And he looks me in the face. He goes, I'm sorry, man. And I'm like, I walk out at him. The last player cut in Detroit. They went to the NFC championship game that year. And let me fast forward something else. So I go to a Buccaneer alumni with my wife and we're, we're, it's alumni weekend and Wayne had coached in Tampa and we're sitting in this alumni booth and there's Wayne Fonts next to me. He's like, Dan, I look over, I go, I don't coach. And you know, my wife did not think it was very cool. He looked over at my wife and he goes, worst decision I ever made was not keeping him on my team. My wife said under her breath, F you. I could hear my wife say that F you. And I sat there and he, she goes, looked at me. My wife goes, coaches talk. Don't be blown away by that. I sat there and he put his arms around me and this and that. He goes, I should have kept you, dude. You started all five games for me. And I'm like, oh man. So that's hard knocks. And, and then the hard knocks continue to live. And man, it's a gut punch, man. Because then you've got to do this. It's like being in broad. That's why I think it conditioned me for broadcasting because program directors, news directors, it's all subjective, dude. As far as I'm concerned, news directors and program directors, you guys are just listeners. Hey, you may not like a style. You may not like a particular guy, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're right. I've proven that numerous times. How about the people who didn't want the Sopranos? Every network. Did you know this? Every network, CBS, NBC, ABC, nobody wanted The Sopranos. HBO takes it. Turns out to be one of the greatest running sitcoms of all time on HBO. Turned out to be maybe the highest rated of all time. That's what made that thing great. So when you, when you watch these hard knocks, and I watch these players that have to be told their dream is over, it's the worst thing in the world because, you know, I, I, I tell people being cut is like having your girlfriend or your wife come to you and say they want a divorce. One of the most difficult things that athletes go through is transition. When you have done something, think of this for a second, just for me. Here, let me add this up here. I played four years of bitty football, four years of high school football, I played five years of college football. Then I played seven years of pro football. 20 years of my life has been playing football, some level, all levels. And all of a sudden, one day, she leaves you. There's no, you know... She just leaves you. You're out. It's over with. You can't play anymore. Toughest thing athletes go through is that transition because it's your true love. Look, you love your family. You love your kids. But your true love, something that you sacrificed your body for, something that you did your entire life, is being taken from you, and you don't want it taken from you. And it's taken from you. 99% of the NFL guys – that have their football taken from them. It's a tough transition. You go through like a time of limbo. You're just hanging there. What do I do? Do I, how, how do I, and you're always looking to try to fill the void. So that's why when I watch the HBO thing, that guy's going to have a tough time. Now for me, I think it's tougher when the guys played a long time. You see, why do you think Tom Brady right now is having a tough time putting down the football? It's do you really think it's about chasing championships or that he loves what he does so much? The game has given him so much passion and love and commitment, taught him all the intangibles. He sacrificed relationships, maybe even his own personal ones. That's why we're seeing a new and different Tom Brady today. Okay. When you leave the game like that, you know, I, I, I've told people who are like, um, like models, 
you know, when a woman is so beautiful when she's younger and she's one of these runaway models and all of a sudden she looks in the mirror and she starts seeing that her looks are going and she's not able to make the same money or have the same impact on the runway that she did in the past where she was on the cover of Vogue and all these big time magazines. It's got to be as brutal for her as it is for the NFL guy who's all of a sudden looking in the mirror too, seeing, man, I just don't have, I, I, I talked to Lawrence Taylor about this and I talked to some of the greats before, like Howie Long, man, how, how he has said this before, you know, just when I started getting really smart and just when I started understanding the intangibles of the game, my body was failing me and the things that I knew that I was supposed to do, I couldn't do anymore. I didn't have the ability to be, I thought it, my mind was there, but my body couldn't catch up to it. So that's kind of what these guys all go through. Can't wait to talk to Marty Colner. Hopefully we can catch up with my friend here. All right, real quick here. I want to throw this at you. I saw this comment today coming out of San Francisco. And I absolutely love it. Do you know what Trey Lance, the third pick in the NFL draft, said over the weekend? Jimmy Garoppolo is the greatest person he's ever been around. What? Jimmy Garoppolo is the greatest person he's ever been around. Why is that significant? Here's why. Because the 49ers were honest with him, unlike the Packers being honest with Aaron Rodgers. They told him what they were doing. They were going to draft a quarterback, kept Jimmy Garoppolo in the loop the entire time. That seamless transition is going on right now in front of your eyes. And you've got the third pick saying this. He's the best guy I've ever been around teaching me the game. That's exactly what you're looking for. That didn't happen in Green Bay. And that's why that transition in San Francisco is going to be more seamless than the transition with Jordan Love in Green Bay. Right there. It's how you deal with people. And Green Bay still doesn't know how to do it. All right. We'll take a quick timeout. Hopefully we'll catch up with our friend Marty Colner, the creator of HBO's Hard Knocks. We'll do that next. You keep it here on the National Football Show. I get scared sometimes. Of a lot of things. Joining in. Decisions. The dark. The dark. But I once heard someone say. But as I always say. It's okay to be afraid. As long as you face the fear. And keep moving forward. Wherever you are in life, count on the name trusted in insurance for over 80 years. Independence Blue Cross. Ah, the savoring taste of a good bag of beef jerky is so enjoyable at any time of the day, as long as you can find it. Here's what we suggest. Pure Bull Beef Jerky is our answer, and soon it will be yours. Locally produced in the Philadelphia region, this high-quality, healthy protein snack is easy to secure. Go to Steersnacks.com, and you'll see hot garlic, tropical heat, Pure Bull Dry Rub, and our favorite, Huck and Fod. What's that? Huck and Fod. Go now to Steersnacks.com. Welcome to the Wildwoods, the perfect place where you can safely do everything or nothing at all. Catch a wave, take a nap, go for a drive, grab a bite. It's your vacation, and we're doing everything we can to make it a safe one. The Wildwoods, your vacation, your way. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 98, is a proud sponsor of The Labor Show with J. Doc and Krause every Saturday night from 6 to 8 p.m. IBEW Local 98's highly trained and superbly skilled electricians are the best in the business, setting the highest safety standards in the electrical industry. So when you're planning your next industrial, commercial, or residential project, choose an IBEW Local 98 union contractor. Learn more at IBEW98.org.
field of life, First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. This is a key. It's a family tree. It's a pair of wings. It's a secret handshake. And a ticket to anywhere in the world. It's more than a uniform. It's the door to a world most people only dream of. There's strong, and then there's Army strong. Try it on at GoArmy.com. Dan Cilio, National Football Show. Appreciate you joining us here. We're going to effort our friend, Marty Kallner, the creator of HBO's Hard Knocks. Real quick here, I want to throw this at you here. It's funny, I think Jason Cole in the previous hour mentioned something that I think is significant when we're talking about Urban Meyer. You know, it, it, it seems to me when you're on television or you're one of these analysts, I mean, look at Aaron Boone. Aaron Boone, how did he get the New York Yankee gig? because he was an analyst for ESPN and he was front and center. And I guess he's a former player and that qualified him to be the Yankee manager, hit a home run in a game, had no managerial experience whatsoever, but he lands a gig like that. I mean, right. Or when you really looked at Bill Cowher, did you really think Bill Cowher was a hall of fame coach? I don't know. I thought Bill Cowher was a very good coach. I wouldn't put Bill Cowher in the game-changing coaches in the history of the league. I thought Bill was really a good coach. But do you think he's better than Dick Vermeil? Who would you take, Dick Vermeil or Bill Cowher? I'm taking Dick Vermeil. I mean, there's been really good coaches that have coached in the NFL that are in that category of really good coaches. Some more significant than others. I was, I was glad to see Tom Flores get into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, first minority to win a Super Bowl, actually two of them, to get into the Hall of Fame. It took them decades to get into the Hall of Fame. They finally did the right thing and got him in. But that doesn't necessarily mean Cower was a superstar coach. He was on a marquee franchise in the Steelers, but really? And he, how about this? I was kind of Switzerland on it. I was like, okay, I guess so. But then I thought about it. I was like, yeah, you know, he, Jason brought a really good point up. I mean, he's on TV, I guess, the exposure. He coached in Pittsburgh, the Roonies, CBS. Did that play into it? I don't know. Jason hinted that it may have. Okay. That blue ribbon committee all of a sudden popped up out of nowhere, folks, last year. It's not there again this year. It was just there for that last year. Okay. So that leads me to Urban Meyer. Urban Meyer, successful coach as we've ever seen in college football. Have we not? I mean, his record at Ohio State is insane. His win percentage at Utah, Florida, what he did at Bowling Green, every single stop has strategically been mapped out by Urban Meyer to put him in the position that he's in right now to have complete control of the Jacksonville Jaguars. And, by the way, Urban Meyer is one of the most revered Ohio State coaches. At Florida, it's him and Steve Spurrier. Okay? Spurrier was the first. He's really the second. And he won more national championships than what Spurrier did in Gainesville. Plus, he had Tebow. He is a god in the state of Florida. So him getting that job, again, strategically mapped out. Now, what does this mean as success at the next level? Why do I think... And why did I think Jimmy Johnson would have the success that he had in the NFL even after Jimmy went 1-15? I still said to people, if you don't think this guy's going to win a Super Bowl, you're crazy. 
I knew it. I knew it. And for Urban Meyer, I'm going to give you my opinion here in a second. I want to get back to hard knocks here because we're getting ready to get our friend Marty Kallner on, the creator of this epic drama. How about this too? Not only drama, but um, it, it's the greatest reality television show that kicks off an NFL season. Each and every single year, it's the greatest reality show. And I've been in, like I just told you, I gave you storylines on how I was called into the coach's office when I was cut three times and also when I was drafted. So there wasn't just all gloom and doom here with this. So for me, it was really, you know, when I first saw it pop on HBO, and this was when the Baltimore Ravens were the very first team. Nobody in the NFL, I think everybody was petrified because you were going to start taking fans behind the scenes of what was going on. And plus what you had to do too, if you were HBO, you had to make it as generic as you possibly can. By the way, all those reality shows like the Osbournes and the Kardashians, in my opinion, I think they probably took something from this HBO because the one thing that the HBO guys did I thought they made sure that it came off as generic as possible. Look, you know there's television cameras on you when you have this series going on. You know that you have it going on, and you know you have everything that's being documented. And especially when it comes to yourself being called into the coach's office, especially if you have to turn your playbook in. It's called the Turk coming to get you. And when the Turk comes to get you, Got to bring your playbook because the coach wants to see you. You get a plane ticket. By the way, you get a plane ticket to anywhere you want to go, wherever that is. You get your last check, whatever that week's check is. They prorate it. They hand it to you. Any bonuses that you made, they give you a plane ticket, and they give you a ride to the airport. That's all they give you. Then they send you on your way. <laughs> and you had to make that as generic as you possibly can. And so putting all those cameras in there and probably still having to coach and direct the players to just be themselves had to be the biggest challenge when it came to putting these things together, because when players know that there's a camera on you, it, you know, I, I, I'll tell you, but when you're in that moment there, maybe, you know, at the end of the day, okay, it really comes off as the greatest reality television show of all time. And we now bring in our friend, Marty Kalner and Marty joins us right now. The creator of the hard knock series, Marty, how you doing? My friend, I'm doing good. How are you? Thank you so much for coming aboard with us here. We really appreciate you doing this. And Marty, a couple questions here for you, for our audience here. Yeah. What was the inspiration for you to put this together? And how did it come together for you to put this reality TV show on? Well, actually, the inspiration came to me out of the air one day. And I was sitting in my house having dinner with my family and I just kind of got quiet for about 15 minutes and then I came out of my trance and told my family I had this great idea I'm going to try to make it happen so I had my manager had a friend in the NFL office named John Collins and I went and pitched the idea to him he said this is pretty interesting um, who is HBO going to do it so I said, I don't know. I'll get back to you. And then uh, the NFL said, well, if you have HBO, we'll consider it. And HBO said, well, if you have the NFL, which you'll never get, we'll consider it. So I told them both I had the other one. And uh, the rest is history. Was there a lot of negotiations going back and forth? And Marty, if you could tilt the camera up a little bit, we'd love to see you here. There you I go. Can't. Okay. Hey, hey, how about that? Marty, was there a lot of negotiations that went back and forth? Um, well, um, yes, there was, there was a lot of negotiations. 
it was very difficult to get the NFL to sign off because, you know, as you know, breaking the shield is pretty impossible. But, you know, there were two people that were in favor of it. One was Jerry Jones, who said he would do it every year. And, in fact, he's doing it this year. And the other was Brian Billick, who is, was the coach of the Ravens and then won the Super Bowl the year before. So he said he would do it. And that got us off to a flying start. Because they had great characters. They had Tony Saragusa, and they had Sterling Sharp. And it was just a phenomenal start to the series, which is now, you know, 20 years ago. So, you know, it turned out to be the most popular sports program in the world. I never expected it. I knew it was a great idea. And, you know, Hard Knocks is about those cuts. When Turk comes to the room and knocks on the door and says, bring your playbook, or now they say, bring your iPad, you know, players actually hide from that. But, you know, to see someone's dreams dash, you know, a star in high school and junior high school and college, and all of a sudden they're on the stage, where everybody's as big and as fast as they are. And my friends in the NFL, that I have some friends as a result of this show, have all told me the same thing. He said, we're all pretty much the same physically. One guy may do a 4-4, four, four, another may do a 4-5. It's all about the mental. And, you know, making it and not making it is razor thin, but the consequences are gargantuan. So also you have these guys who, who want to make it a and make it for their family who supported them through their dreams all this time and they want to pay them back. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty real reality show. Marty, with that being said then, was it easy not to have to direct these players and these coaches because, like you said, it's one thing to have cameras on you. It's another thing when we're talking about people's dreams, their aspirations, their goals in life. Did you have to do any kind of directing with the players? In today's society, these players want as much screen time as they can get. So the answer to that is just the opposite. Um, you know, they're all selfie-based. They're all Instagram-based. And they're all trying to build a brand. So as much as they can be on television, the more it helps them build their brand. And so in that case, it was easy. You know, they want it. They want to be on it. And they still want to be on it. You know, and the NFL made a rule called the Hard Knocks Rule because the show was so popular and so good for the league that they said any concerns for privacy are outweighed for the, because of the value, of promotional value of things to the league and to the teams. Marty, what was tougher to direct and to put together, your legendary catalog of music videos or this series of Hard Knocks? They've all been hard. <laughs> not, not of them are easy you know working with the Stones was hard working with Aerosmith was hard and going etc cetera, etc cetera. and this was hard but you know the journey into the unknown is often fraught with peril and and uh, fear but when you make it out the other side it's the only true reward you can have so yeah they've been difficult but you know thank god I've been lucky and have persevered What's your favorite Hard Knocks? The first one. The first one with Baltimore. He was interested in the team. It doesn't really matter who the team is. Okay, I think we're having a little bit of uh, difficulty. Hopefully, I'd like to finish up with him if I possibly can uh, to see if we can uh, get him back on here. He's, he his working with the Rolling Stones and working with Errol Smith. His categories of being able to put some of the greatest videos together of all time. If you look and you Google him, you'll see that he has some of the greatest catalogs of all time when it comes to the music videos that you saw on MTV. He and MTV, there you go. So why why was it Baltimore, Marty? Why did you like the first one the most? Because they won the Super Bowl the year before, A, and B, they had such great characters. So they made a good, made a good television. 
mean, Sarah Goose became a star because of Hard Knocks. And, you know, him and Sharp were cut-ups. And I still remember him talking to the tight end, telling him not to bring his wife around. I mean, it was just, it was just amazing. It was just new and fresh. And, you know, it, uh, it always be dear to my heart. And I'm very, very grateful that Brian Billick had the foresight to allow it to happen and champion it. Marty, music, music people or athletes more complex to work with, in your opinion, or does there a lot of similarities between the two? There's similarities. They're all performers, so you know they're all some are really difficult to work with. The projects are difficult, but I find the athletes and the and the music performers to be really decent people. They just want to be handled correctly, and if you're smart and you handle them with care and respect that they're going to give it right back to you. And really, Marty, you've had such great relationships with many of the people that you've worked with. Your favorite artist that you worked with? My favorite artist I worked with? Uh, wow, I think Mark Anthony is my favorite artist I ever worked with. Why? He's real. He's hardworking. We're still good friends. We just had this connection. I've had connection to many, many of my artists. But if you ask me my favorite, Mark's my favorite. In closing here, I know that you had a loss and one of the greatest videos of all time, the White Snakes. And I knew Tony, myself, Tony Catan, ended up passing away. And I know that you guys were going to do something um, a few months before um, you guys had worked on putting something together and you were going to maybe get together. I think she was talking about something like that. And I saw that it really broke you down a little bit that especially yeah, somebody it, that you had worked with. Yeah, it destroyed me. Um, we were very, very close. I have a, a show on Clubhouse called the Marty Colner Factor. She was going to be, Clubhouse is a, an app, a social media app, and she was going to be my first guest. And we were talking every day, messaging. And, and when, she, when I got the news, I was actually on with Dane Cook, and I... And then he came back and he said, well, maybe a rumor. So I started texting her incessantly saying, please get back to me. Please get back to me. I just want to know you're okay. And when she didn't get back to me, I knew it wasn't a rumor. We still don't know how she died. You know, her brother thinks it was a broken heart, but we don't have any clue what really happened. I know there was no drugs or alcohol involved. And she was a very, very special friend and a friend of my family. And as a matter of fact, I wrote I wrote about it. My son Jez wrote a beautiful uh, message about her passing and what she meant to us. That you know just made me cry like a baby, and a lot of other people too. Marty, I'll tell you what: you have great relationships with everybody, and I value ours so much. And Thanks, what you man. do in the video, and what you do with Hard Knocks, I thank you so much for taking time with your You're family welcome. to do this for me. Thank you so much, Marty. All right. Man. Thank you. You bet. Marty Collender, the creator of the Hard Knocks series. Favorite is the first one with Brian Billick's Baltimore Ravens. They had just come off winning a championship, and there were so many great personalities. Ray Lewis was on that team. Tony Saragusa. Shannon Sharp was on that team. Um, yeah, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think Trent Dilfer was on that football team too. All right, we'll take a brief timeout. Keep it right here on the National Football Show. I get scared sometimes. Of a lot of things. Joining in. Decisions. The dark. The dark. But I once heard someone say. But as I always say. It's okay to be afraid. As long as you face the fear. And keep moving forward. Wherever you are in life, count on the name trusted in insurance for over 80 years. Independence Blue Cross. Ah, the savoring taste of a good bag of beef jerky is so enjoyable at any time of the day, as long as you can find it. Here's what we suggest. Pure Bull Beef Jerky is our answer, and soon it will be yours. Locally produced in the Philadelphia region, this high-quality, healthy protein snack is easy to secure. Go to Steersnacks.com, and you'll see hot garlic, tropical heat, Pure Bull Dry Rub, and our favorite, Huck and Fod. What's that? Huck and Fod. Go now to Steersnacks.com. Welcome to the Wildwoods, the perfect place where you can safely do everything or nothing at all. Catch a wave, take a nap, 
go for a drive, grab a bite. It's your vacation, and we're doing everything we can to make it a safe one. The Wildwoods. Your vacation, your way. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 98, is a proud sponsor of The Labor Show with J. Doc and Krause every Saturday night from 6 to 8 p.m. IBEW Local 98's highly trained and superbly skilled electricians are the best in the business, setting the highest safety standards in the electrical industry. So when you're planning your next industrial, commercial, or residential project, choose an IBEW Local 98 union contractor. Learn more at IBEW98.org. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. This is a key. It's a family tree. It's a pair of wings. It's a secret handshake. And a ticket to anywhere in the world. It's more than a uniform. It's the door to a world most people only dream of. There's strong, and then there's Army strong. Try it on at GoArmy.com. Welcome back. National Football Show, Dan Cilio. Now I know why Jerry Jones said yes to being on Hard Knocks for a third time. Jerry was one of the people that were in front of this thing when it first came out years and years ago when they put the Ravens as the first team. It was Jerry as really a Pied Piper selling it to the NFL. This is going to be something good. Again, you know, we, we, we mentioned Jerry Jones at being one of the greatest salespeople of all time. Hard Knocks would never have gotten across the finish line if Jerry Jones doesn't go and promote this as something good for the league. You got to remember something. I mean, what are we talking? Plus 25 years now that Hard Knocks has been on. If you don't have an owner like Jerry Jones that's going to be promoting something like this, back then the NFL owners were like Kent Cook and all them dudes. Okay, Norman Brayman, who owned the Eagles. You think those guys were going to put television cameras inside their NFL offices and how they did business? That was never going to happen. No way. Two guys, Al Davis, Jerry Jones, guys like that would be in favor of something like this because why? More eyeballs on the league. More eyeballs on the sport. Jerry Jones was so right. There's no question. Now I found out the creator of Hard Knocks just said it. Jerry Jones was the Pied Piper to this thing. And that's why they're on for a third time. Because this was Jerry's baby along with Marty, Hard Knocks. It's the best reality television show going. There's no question about it. But that just shows you again one more time about, you know, how I opened the program. Jerry is more, again, If this is not a quintessential view of how Jerry sees the league, Jerry wants television cameras on his sport, on his team. This is what sells the NFL, drama. How about this? I'll give you a great example of something here. And believe me when I say this to you, do I think Jerry Jones wants to win a Super Bowl? Of course I do. But Jerry Jones has come to the understanding of not winning the Super Bowl, what that means financially to him. Remember how I told you when I first started the show out? Hey, man, (laughs) when the Philadelphia 76ers got bounced from the playoffs, you should have heard Philly. Oh, my God, Doc sucks. I had Krause going, 
throwing Ben Simmons under the bus. What the hell's that's so BS. You're going like this. Perfect. Thank you. That's the response I want. Because in the end, I win. That's wonderful. Thank you for that response. Holy cow, you're engaged. Engagements. I don't care if you like me. I care you listen to me. I care you watch me. It's not important. But if I can make you inspired enough to go, silly, oh, you suck. You know, to me, when I have people writing all that crap on Twitter at Dan Cilio Show about me, I'm going to use a Charlie Sheen line. Winning. Winning. I'm winning. Jerry's winning. When Jerry's team fails, you really think he's losing at the gate? Greatest ratings of all time last year for the Cowboy games. You want to take a look at what the top-rated television shows were last year? Go in there and figure out that the Cowboys, six times out of the top 10 shows last year, were the highest-rated TV shows. Oh, and by the way, that TV show goes on for three hours. It's basically like a docudrama every single Sunday. Three hours. You imagine the advertising dollars that are inside of three hours. What's an average movie? An hour and a half? Okay, what's a sitcom? 30 minutes? You're lucky if you can sell a 30-minute sitcom. How many pilots go down the drain because they don't have enough people watching the thing or streaming the damn thing? Jerry's got three hours of your money. You think that's losing? Yeah, but the Cowboys, man, I think they won only four or five games last year. Oh, okay. What, are you a wrestling fan? You must be. Over here, McFly. Over here. Right? You're not getting it, man. You're not getting it. That guy, he is the best. He's a better version of Al Davis. Now, Al was a better football person than Jerry because Al won in multiple decades, and Al was a former coach of the year in the AFL. Al's background is coaching. Jerry's is as a suspect player at Arkansas. He was on a national championship team. I won't deny him that. Told you, I give people kudos. And he's a spectacular businessman. But as a football dude, I don't know. He made the right hire in Jimmy. You know, and I always tell people this about the Cowboys. Well, if Jerry was such a mastermind at building that Cowboy dynasty, why hasn't he done it again? You see, Al did it. Al built the dynasty in the early 70s. Then he built it in the 80s. Then he won it again in the 90s. Al was a guy who can put football teams together, and he knew how to hire personnel people. Jerry's got the same personnel people. As a matter of fact, the one common denominator in the Cowboys' football lack thereof success over the last 26, seven years has been Jerry's been the GM. I mean, if you think about it, and again, this is – You've, you, you've got to look at the gold jacket that he wears in, in proper perspective, okay? Is he a great NFL man? Absolutely. Is he a great promoter of the NFL? Absolutely. Marty Colner just said if it wasn't for Jerry, there would be no hard knocks. There would be no hard knocks. But when it comes to putting football teams together, he got lucky when he named his best friend in college, Jerry or Jimmy Johnson, the head football coach and head of operations. See, Jimmy was the head of operations when it came to the player personnel part of it. When it came to football stuff, Jim, Jimmy ran it. Sure, Jerry stroked the checks. And I've heard Larry Lacewell say this many times who was in that front office, and he was friends with both of those guys as they were growing up in Arkansas was that Jimmy's biggest mistake was is that he didn't let Jerry play with his toy more. And he didn't let Jerry be as engaged as he should have. And Jimmy has a regret with that. He said, you know, I mean, if I had to do that all over again, it would be me letting Jimmy or Jerry get back into 
you know, the ability because he used to kick him off the field. You know, we see Jer- Jerry Jones on the field now. You couldn't go on the field. Jimmy, Jimmy hated him on the field. He hated him around his guys because he thought it undermined him. You see, you see him there all the time undermining his head coaches now. And Jimmy didn't like that. It was something that was like foreboding with Jimmy. Get his, you would hear him saying, get his ass off the sidelines. He'd be telling Rich Dalrymple, the PR director, who was caught in the middle numerous times in an argument. By the way, Rich was my PR guy at the University of Miami, and he's been in Dallas ever since. And I've talked to Rich about this, man. You don't know how many times, man. Jimmy screaming at me, then Jerry screaming at me. I'm caught in the middle. Finally, you know what I would he would do? He would stand near a goalpost and stand in the middle because he, he didn't want to go to one or, one or the other. So he just let it settle. That's how Rich Dalrymple kept his job all these years as the public relations guy for the Cowboys. He would just stand in the middle. And because Jimmy brought him there, and he was loyal to Jimmy, but he's working for Jerry now. And these two dudes are like going, you know, back and forth there. And you're like listening to this thing. It's really ridiculous. Anyway, all right, let's move on to this. So... I'm all for giving people second chances. God knows, right? If I'm not the poster child for it. So Josh Gordon wants to be reinstated again. Do you know how many drug tests he's failed? Six. Six. Hit me in the head with a hammer. The next time I put a dumb dude on my football team, that's a dumb dude. Is he get? I'll tell you this. I saw him a couple of years ago when he came off a of suspension. I think he'd been out of the game for two years. And I saw him go for 114 yards in like 10 catches or whatever it was against the Chargers. And I couldn't believe what I was watching. I could not believe how great. Josh Gordon was. I could not believe, and all the things I said about him, Flash Gordon, this, and I could not believe what I was watching. I said, that guy right there is the best player at that position of any wideout in the game. I could not believe what I had seen. Like two years he was out of the game. One game, I- I'm watching a guy, and I'm just doing this. Holy crap, is this guy great? That's what makes what I'm saying so difficult. Now, look, he's a pot smoker. The league has relaxed itself a lot on marijuana. So is the country. Okay. Just like Shikari Richardson, the sprinter who failed a marijuana test, and people are now doing this. Hey, man, she failed a marijuana test. And, you know, rule's a rule. Unfortunately, those people are right. If I knew this, I had an NFL season to get through or I was going after a gold medal. And those things were that important to me. I'm not going to smoke weed. How about this one? If I knew I had to stop at every single stop sign and not roll through them so that I could become an Olympian, Something that takes no athleticism. It just takes discipline. I'm going to do it. I'm not going to let my lack of discipline. And you know what people say? Well, dad, it's a, my daughter says the same thing. And my wife says the same. It's a dumb rule. That's not the point. This is about discipline. You've got to have some discipline in your life. A rule is a rule. Okay. Some are dumb. Jason Cole and I were talking about the Reggie Bush dumb rules that causes Heisman to be taken away. It's discipline or lack thereof. Six times this guy has failed a drug test. What are you under the impression there won't be a seventh? Look, as great as he is, why would I want the headache on my team? Okay, I mean, there's going to be a seventh time. Why even go through it? Yeah, but Dan, it's pot. I get it. But you don't need to bring that on your team. 
It's called self-inflicted wounds. You're trying to distract people, okay? Keep distractions away from your team. You don't want distractions and distractive people on your team. All right. Krause, great stuff. Cal, as usual, man, really great stuff. Big Joe, we thank you. Don't forget, if you missed any of the show, do me a favor. Go over to the Jacob Media channel. You can click and share and like. We so appreciate you coming aboard. Four to six Eastern time each and every single Monday through Friday. We'll catch you tomorrow. We'll catch you on the flip side.